Hello everybody, James here and it's WSI once again and my guest this week, I mean what can you say with somebody who's been in the business so long? It's tough enough writing these questions for somebody who's been in the business so many decades but I'll just do this introduction of one half of the high flyers, one half of the killer bees and a man who can lay claim to having the greatest drop kick in wrestling history. It is of course Jumping Jim Brunzel, how are you? Very good James, thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, I uh, and I didn't mess up the introduction. That might only be no, the third. Oh, you did a great job. I <laughs> might only be the third time I've ever done this. Uh, I'll tell you one thing I I didn't mention also just as we were chatting beforehand about our various ailments we're going through and uh, and the temperatures is I also do a weekly uh, show with Don Morocco. And oh, yeah. the one thing I didn't do was ask Don Morocco to dig up some dirt on you to <laughs> oh, <laughs> to mention. But uh, you know, Don sorry, carry on. Was, uh, uh, Don was uh, very influential. Um, I remember he was in uh, Minneapolis and he was a baby face and he was a great baby face. Good looking son of a gun, broad shoulders, great body. And, um, you know, I, I made some trips with him. I actually helped him move out. And then uh, it was funny because then when I wound, I, I crossed paths with him again, it was in New York. <laughs> and it was, you know, geez, it was, you know, uh, 15 years later and he, you know, he weighed 295 pounds and he was a heel. And, and uh, you know, I remember Brian and I used to work with him and Bobby Orton on the road a couple of times and, and they, they, <laughs> they didn't want to do anything in the ring with us. So it was like pulling teeth, but, you know, I, I've, I've heard Don's done real well now and he's lost some weight and looks good. So it, when you see him or talk to him, please greet him for me, would you? Yeah, I absolutely will. And this sort of segues mentioning Don into the first real question is because you were one of the, were you one of the, in the first group of uh, trainees yes, at Vern Gagne. Don Morocco says himself, that uh, everybody liked him as a sort of guest trainer because he didn't work people as hard as everybody else did, like Vern and Billy uh, Billy Robinson. Well, here's the deal. You know, this this training camp that we went to was six weeks long. It was six days a week, and it was almost six hours a day. And Billy Robinson was uh, a little sadistic, or maybe he was a lot sadistic in terms of dealing with us because – he was so proficient at submission holds, you know, and, and training with Billy Riley and, and Carl, I knew Carl Gotch and all this hook him. And, and honest to God, he made life miserable, but he did get us in great shape. And I remember when we started, uh, we used to have to run, I don't know, a mile. And then we do all these calisthenics. And I remember we started doing the free squats, just a regular free squat, you know, and we worked up to a thousand free squats a day, 10 sets of a hundred before we'd start our, our, our workout <laughs> in the ring. So yeah, he was something. And then Vern came in at the very end and when we were all nice and tired and then just sort of beat the crap out of us. <laughs> so how often did Don turn up to help them? Was it just an occasional thing? Yeah, he was just there. You know, the, the, the AWA was still, you know, they were on the road and working. So he was, you know, probably working two, three days. And I think that the last thing he wanted to do was come and risk injury, you know, fooling around with the, the likes of Patera and, you know, Ric Flair and, and Greg and myself and Kazro Vaziri and uh, Bobby Brugger. So he was there a couple of times. <laughs> with... Uh... With the training camp, uh, I believe that Greg Garnier, because you were in, you did, uh, was it high school football or college football, excuse me, that uh, you two guys college. were? So, college. And yes. that's how you heard of the camp, I imagine. Uh, did you have to sort of almost prove yourself to Vern as well that you'd be a good fit for a professional wrestler? Well, he they sort of asked me because <clears throat> here's the deal. When Greg and I were freshmen, uh, 17 years old, and we both walked on at the University of Minnesota football, that means we didn't get a scholarship. So he and I uh, actually teamed up pretty well in the freshman team and he, we, you know, connected well and became good friends. And then he invited me over to his house, you know, during the course of, you know, two years, uh, he transferred after his sophomore year to Wyoming and I got a chance to know Vern and actually I'll never forget. I was invited over there. And Vern had and Vern had a beautiful mansion on uh, a, big, a big lake and 
South Minneapolis called Lake Minnetonka. And he had the a Viking, Minnesota Viking coaching staff over there. And he hired this um, uh, chef uh, to cook. And he had this huge grill and they had these little filet mignons about like that. And they're, the grill was full of them. So Vern came up to me and he says, Jim, you can have as many as those as you want. And I ate them like cookies. I think I had three or four of them and they were like four or five ounces. It was wonderful. And then at the end of that, you know, end of uh, my college football, I uh, played one year as semi-pro and then I uh, had an invitation to the Washington Redskins, went down there, didn't get asked back. So I was going to go back to college and then Greg called me and said, hey, Jim, my dad's having a wrestling camp. Ken Patera's, you know, uh, just coming back from the Olympics. And there's going to be Ric Flair, who was, a, you know, high school uh, wrestling champion in Wisconsin. And Bob Bruggers, who played in the NFL. And Kazro, who was an uh, Iranian, uh, you know, Greco-Roman uh, champion. And then uh, Greg and myself. So I said, okay. And the way we went, next thing I know, I was in the wrestling, you know, in the locker room saying, what in the heck am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> when, um, when in the training, did you fully understand what pro wrestling was? I mean, did you, did you understand the nature of pro wrestling before you went in and when did, or, and who gave you, I suppose, uh, you know, the talk of, uh, how to, well, how to work? Well, basically Vern didn't smarten us up at all until the last week. And then he explained to us that <clears throat> what we're doing in professional wrestling is called to work. And he said, your main objective is to protect your opponent. And his main objective is to protect you as you tell a story. And that was it. So, you know, uh, and I cried, we had such great talent here. It was unbelievable. So I couldn't help but learn. And then, you know, it was shortly, I, I think I spent three or four months here and they sent me down to Kansas City where Bob Geigel and Pat O'Connor were the promoters. And <laughs> I, I, I wrestled seven days a week and twice a night. And I remember, uh, I remember my first week working in the AWA. I got $860. And I remembered my first week in Kansas City. I worked 14 times and made $127.95. They pay you 25 bucks a night. And thank God that got better. Yeah. Otherwise, I never would have been able. But I was single, and I had a very Spartan life. I had a one-bedroom efficiency that I paid 145 bucks worth for it. And then I actually just cooked eggs and, and, and cooked chicken uh, you know, every day, and that was it. Did you do the Did you do the whole trans thing where, let's say, you drive and then you charge the veterans, you know, a few cents a mile, and then sell them sandwiches on the road and stuff to make ends meet? No, they they uh, they were pretty good. You know, they realized that when we were starting, we didn't have much money, so they, you know, a, a few guys, uh, you know, didn't charge us trans. But when the rookies went together, we we made sure that if so and so dried, then you know, everybody, you know, kick in and pay for the gas, et cetera. So it worked out pretty good. One more thing before I get off the camp is what was the contract that Vern made you sign? Because I've heard that in the contract, it said something like he got 25 or 30% of your earnings for life in professional wrestling afterwards. Does, does that ring true? No. He, I always wondered what was going to be the, the hook, you know, so he he basically said once you know he made sure that everybody was going to be a pro wrestler you know so he told me afterwards he says here's the deal he says i'm going to get 10% of your gross for 5 years so i thought well 10% you know and i i thought okay so it was funny because I was the only one after I came back from Kansas city, you know, <laughs> and wrestled as Greg's partner for 74 until 85 or whatever it was. And I went one year down there, a year and a half down to um, North Carolina. I was the only guy out of that crew that paid the, the 10% for the five years. 
all the rest has been gone. You know, Rick went to Carolinas, Patera went all over and Cosrell went all over Oklahoma and Texas and then wound up in, uh, you know, uh, the mid Atlantic and then wound up in the WWE. So I was the only one that paid the, you know, 10% for the full five years. I can't imagine that Greg was paying 10% as well. Oh, he was paying 20. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you know, I'll actually go to Greg then straight away. And first sure. time meeting Greg, some stories about Greg, uh, and then we'll get onto the wrestling. But the first time you met Greg and, and uh, so forth. Well, the first time I met him, he was a quarterback and uh, he was, uh, he was smaller than me. <laughs> we were both about the same size, but I think I weighed 185 or 190 and he weighed about 160, 165 pounds, but he was a, he was a great athlete in high school and he was football, basketball and baseball player. And he was a good quarterback. Uh, the only problem is that a quarterback who played for university of Minnesota under Murray Warmath had to be about 220 pounds and be able to run the ball, you know, at least two plays out of a series because he, Murray Warmath believed in uh, field position and ball control. And he didn't like to throw a pass worth being. So Greg realized that the fact he was getting the crap beat out of him <laughs> and they switched him to safety and then he'd have to come up, you know, in practice and hit Jimmy Carter, who weighed 235 pounds. It wasn't, you know, after his sophomore year, he says, hey, I'm going to transfer to my, uh, Wyoming and see if he can play. And he did wind up playing there in a few games, so it was good for him. So what did he tell you about wrestling when you were both uh, doing American football? Uh, and uh, did he ever try and recruit you before you ended up going? No. Uh, like I said, you know, he invited me out to his house, and I saw what a great life Vern had. I mean, oh, geez, his house was beautiful. He had a beautiful uh, basement office and he had a little waterfalls in there and he was, you know, it was just a gorgeous house. And, you know, he probably had a thousand feet of shoreline. And I remember for a fact that, um, Greg told me that for, uh, real estate tax on that house, he paid $110,000 a year to live on the lake. That's just what the tax was. But uh, you thought, well, if you worked, if it all worked out, that that could be the life for you as well. Massive house well, of the lake. Maybe just 25 feet of uh, shoreline instead of you know, a thousand. <laughs> what did you make of Greg then as a tag team partner? Actually, uh, more specifically, when you were told you were going to be teaming up with Greg, were you happy because you knew the guy and you could work together essentially? Or were you a bit like, it's the boss's son, I'm a single young man on the road getting up to no good? Where was the sort of good and bad of working with Greg in that aspect? You know what? We were a great team. And, and, and I think what made us uh, so efficient in the ring was the talent that we had to work with. I mean, the AWA had unbelievable talent. I mean, they had Bachwinkle, Heen and Bobby Duncombe, Jack Lanza, you know, Don Morocco, um, Ray Stevens, Pat Patterson, um, and, you know, Bobby Heenan to me uh, throughout my career, uh, I recognized as the greatest overall talent, bar none. I mean, he could do anything. He could talk. He was incredible in the ring. Um, and just a wonderful guy and perfect in the ring. His timing was uh, meticulous. And, and same with Bachwinkle. And, and so – the fact that I got to learn with this great talent, you know, was just a, a jump start for me in my career. How do you rate Greg then as a wrestler? Because I think in the last decade or so, there's been a real appraisal of how good Greg was as a professional wrestler. Whereas at the time, I think people couldn't get past that he was a lot thinner than everybody else on the roster. Well, James, the, 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 the hardest thing about Greg was that he was a son of the Vern, great Vern Gagne. So that's awful hard to follow. His dad was a national champion in college and was a, almost an All-American in football. And then he had a, an unbelievable professional wrestling career. And uh, a lot of the, uh, the promoters in the various territories 
were jealous of Helen. And consequently, Greg was insulated in his career because he couldn't go anyplace. You know, I mean, because some guys, you know, would probably, he'd be fighting every night, which he would, he would fight. He's a tough guy. And, and uh, I felt sorry for Greg because he didn't have an opportunity ex- to experience what it was like going, you know, and, and actually living the real life of a, a professional wrestler during the territory time, you know, I mean, when that 30 year, 20 years of territories. I'm going to move on from Greg then. And this is something that I've heard Greg talk about. And I really hope that you can talk about it as well. Mad Dog for Sean and the plane. Were well, you on the plane that day? No. And oh. I'll tell I'll tell you what happened though. <laughs> and I just told us the other night. We Vern bought a plane. It was called it was a Piper Navajo Chieftain. It was a seven-seater. And um what happened was Matt, we were in Omaha, Nebraska wrestling. I flew down commercially because I was scared to death of this damn plane. And we they, Vern hired this Dagon ex-military uh, pilot, and that son of a gun thought he could fly through, you know, a tornado, and he'd still, you know, it scared the shit out of all of us. So what happened was Mad Dog, his son, was in trouble in Montreal. So Mad Dog was going to fly um, from Omaha to Minneapolis and then get in the car and drive that night to Montreal, and he asked me if I had any bennies. And, you know, everybody, uh, when you were on the road, then everybody had their own little medicine cabinet, and they had the bennies, and they had the sleeping pills, and they had, you know, uh, some pain medicines. So I gave Mad Dog two 15-milligram dexedrine spaniels, which were time-released. And I told him, I says, Mad Dog, here's the deal. Don't take this until you get in your car at the airport and you head to Montreal. I says, it'll, it'll make you drive fine for 10 hours. So he said, okay. So during the court, and he was in the main event that night. And what had happened was he was sitting there and he had a little pint of Southern comfort and he was drinking that and feeling pretty good. So he took the pill. Before the match, you know, and he had a hell of a match. I get they disqualified him because he was out in the Diagon crowd and swinging at people and everything. So what happened was he gets on the plane, and Adrian Adonis, who was on the plane, God rest his soul, Keith Franks, um, noticed that he was real hyper and really. <laughs> so he gave him a quaalude, which is a downer. So and then. Mad Dog was continually drinking the Southern Comfort. So he's got a a Benny in him and a Quaalude. And he just sort of freaked out. And when the plane, it was, they were going six, they were 6,000 feet up. They were going 189 or 190 miles an hour. He decides to open the door. And thank God. Uh, the guy who was flying then was a, a Northwest Orient pilot and, you know, cut down the speed and everything. And they landed success- successfully and they had the door pulled in and they had Mad Dog to the side. So the next morning, Vern Gagne's office called me and um, Mary Ann, the secretary, she said, uh, Jim, uh, Vern would like to talk to you. So I, I said, Vern, I didn't know anything about it because I had taken the doggone commercial flight home in the morning, you know, and didn't. And he said, he says, you son of a gun. He says, you damn near killed everybody. I said, what do you mean? And he says, those damn pills you gave Mad Dog, he he went crazy and opened the damn door. Uh, And I thought, oh, God. So I had to go down and talk to him and we straightened it out a little bit. But yeah, they I mean, that was that was a real miracle that. You know, they didn't, they all didn't perish. Jesus. Who who shopped you in for giving him the, the benzo? Or Benny? Pardon? Who shopped you in for giving him the pills? I, I told him, I, I told him myself. Because he, he didn't know what I, he said, I heard you gave him something. I said, yeah, I, he, I, I told him, I said, he told me he was going to drive from Minneapolis to Montreal. 
So I said I had a couple of bennies to give him, and I said he might have taken both of them. I know he took one for sure. So, yeah, so Mad Dog was banned from the plane for a little bit, and I still flew commercial after that, but uh, they finally got rid of that plane, thank God. <laughs> I can't imagine that would have filled you with confidence to get on a, on a small jet afterwards as well if, with Mad Dog. Well, see, this was a prop plane, and, it, and it, was un- it wasn't pressurized, so it only can fly – at probably six to 8,000 feet above, you know. And <laughs> so we were at the mercy of whichever way he flew the damn thing. And, and he he was the type of guy, this Roy Bradley, he never deviate between two points. And if there was a thunderstorm in here, he'd see going a little bit around it, but it's still, you know, we'd have down drafts and up drafts. And I remember Pompero Furpo, the wild bull of the pompous, he got up in a meeting and he said, Fern, he says, that plane is like flying in a coffin. <laughs> it, it could have been the coffin as well if Mad yeah, Dog was hanging about. <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, give us a couple more Mad Dog stories as far as... Right, so Don told me recently, or a think I read somewhere, you'll have to excuse me, I didn't write this question down, was Mad Dog and either the Crusher or the Bruiser always had issues with each other, yet they were always paired together because they were box office. Do you remember any of that? Well, I think they were all had that ego about them. You know, me being, I mean, you know, Mad Dog and the Crusher were uh, villains against each other, when, you know, and then Crusher was a baby face and then they turned Mad Dog a baby face. But I remember I had to wrestle, and this is a true story. I had to wrestle, and this is in my book, Mad Lance. I had to wrestle uh, Mad Dog in Denver. So, I was, I thought, oh God, here we go. And then I, and Denver was a real good town for me. So we get in the ring, we tie up. And of course he doesn't say anything about what we're going to do in the match. So I had to follow him this and that, whatever. So we get in the ring, he backs me up into the turnbuckle. He hits me and he said, reverse. So I reverse and I hit him and he says harder. So I hit him again harder and he says harder. And I wound up hitting him. And when I hit him, I hit him right on the chin. And, it, and he went down to the last turnbuckle, shook his head. And I thought, oh, my God, what did I do? And he popped out. He poked me in the eyes. And then he, he put his finger in my mouth like that inside. And then he grabbed me and threw me through, through the ropes onto the floor. So I'm laying on the floor and I thought, oh, God. And then all of a sudden, everything blacked out. And he got on the apron with both of his feet and jumped on my chest. So I was completely out of air. So as he went to throw me back in the ring, he said, not that hard. (laughs) So that, and that's the honest gospel truth. So somehow brother, we made it through that. I made it through that mask and he says, thank you, Jimmy. (laughs) And he'd claw that crap out of you. He'd bite you and he'd, he had these little paws and he, he never knew what, his fingers were in, so, you know, I thought, oh, God, I didn't like the idea of sticking his fingers in my mouth, but what could I do? I know, if the UFC is going to ban that in, like, what, UFC 4 or something, that's like that and they- eye gouging, <laughs> yeah. Like, that was the first thing they banned, so it can't be uh, can't be all but- I've got a ton of questions about the AWA, I know. We never get to as many questions. I write a million questions, but if we get more time, I'll go back to it. Um, one, okay. uh, there was a couple of things before we move on to WWF stuff, and uh, a couple of games I've got for you but one thing I'm going to ask you is you found yourself in Georgia Championship Wrestling in 1975 and if I find out anybody's wrestled in Georgia I always have to ask memories of Ole Anderson I liked Ole you know and I think Ole was from Minnesota and I think he might even have been trained by Vern and he had his own idea of you know how to run a wrestling business and in Georgia you know, they ran the same towns every week and uh, he, he had a hell of a crew. And I remember they, Greg and I went down there for a week and we wrestled um, Bob Orton and Dickie Slater and what a team they were. Oh, and we just tore the house down, just tore the house down. And then uh, we had a couple other matches and then we were supposed to, I think we were supposed to wrestle Orton and Dickie Slater in the Omni, you know, for the, the last night we were there. And somehow or other they switched it and we re- wrestled Gerald, Bris- Gerald Briscoe and somebody else. But I had a good match, but not nearly 
what we would have uh, had. But, you know, I, I, I went to, I, I worked for Barnett after I left um, Carolinas in, in 1980, just for a little bit. And um, I, I just really, I was tired of that Southern scene and the, you know, the same towns, you know, every week or every other week. And I remember um, Jim Barnett came up to me and said, Jimmy, he says, what do you really want out of professional wrestling? And I said, well, I said, I want to make as most money as I can. And I said, the only way I can do that is by being a, a champion. And he says, well, what do you want to do? And I says, well, I'm going to go up to, I'm going to go back to Minnesota. And he said to me, Jimmy, he said, if you go back to Vern, he says, that'll be the worst decision of your wrestling career. And I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. So I left, went back there. They reunited Greg and I, and I made $85,000, which was the biggest pay year I ever had in the business. So he was wrong. <laughs> Evidently he was wrong. Now, you've mentioned this a couple of times there. So Georgia and a lot of the Southern Territories w would run every town every week on the same day. What was the schedule like in the AW AWA? Did you have regular towns once a month more like or even further? Yeah. Spent apart? Well, we had our main cities, you know, Chicago, Milwaukee, Green Bay, Denver, Winnipeg, and then St. Paul, Minneapolis, and then Moline, Illinois, Peoria, Illinois. And then to fill in the gap, they'd, they'd run spot shows around there. So, you know, we'd, we'd go to Fargo, North Dakota, and then we might go to Jamestown, North Dakota, and then come back and do Grand Fall or Great, whatever it was. And uh, East Grand, For or Grand Forks. And then, you know, it was, it was a breeze because Vern realized that um, you know, you couldn't work every day. So in Minnesota, you might work four days a week and that was a heavy week, but it, it was funny. That was, that was the normal, <laughs> normal schedule in down South. It was seven days a week and I'll never forget. And I know I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, George Scott, who was the booker in, in Charlotte, when I went down there in 1979, uh, he told me, he says, Jimmy, he says, it's a little different here than Minnesota. And he says, we don't give any days off, so don't ask for any. <laughs> oh, dearie, mate. I, I don't know how people cope with that. And then you went to the WWF afterwards during the rock and wrestling. You never got any days off there either. But uh, we're not going to go WWF just yet. Uh, okay. One more thing about the AWA is I've heard recently that you wouldn't really work much over the summer. Is that true? No, that's true because... Uh, in the Midwest, like right now, people are cooped up all winter long. And then in the summer, people are at their cabins every week, you know, are, are doing something. They, they really, I mean, fishing's big and outdoors, you know, boating is big. So Vern realized I'm only going to stick with the main towns. I'm not going to run any spot shows. So, you know, you might work three times a week, which was great during the summer because the boys had a a life to live, you know, that everybody had their family here. So you could, you know, have a, a recreational summer like a, a normal person would. So would you work like once or twice a week or would it just be shut down for a couple of months and see you in September? Oh, no. It, it, it was, they, they never shut down the big town. So, you know, you'd run, you know, maybe a, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, maybe a Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, maybe a Friday, Sunday, you know, it was, it was always three days a week at least. One more thing before we uh, go into the first game. And I don't know if this is the kind of thing that you are asked all the time or you're never asked about, but do you remember filming uh, Highlander? I do. And I, I know we were in New Jersey that night and um, we we're at the Meadowlands and it was the first time they used the overhead camera on that, uh, cable. And um, I remember we worked with the Tonga kids, Tonga kids. And it was, you know, the, the, the part that they filmed that was so um, short in the, in the movie that I thought, holy God, it was, you know, it was just boom and it was done, but it was a, a thrill for us. And I think, um, I think we made $500. Vern probably got 20 grand and gave us each 500. So 
<laughs> and probably we got told, something for you. Yeah, probably told you and uh, think yourself lucky for having it as well. I'm sure that's true. Yeah, um, <laughs> with, with the filming, was it just extra? <coughs> all all it was was extra cameras there, and you just did your match, and that was it. You weren't given any special direction. You weren't told to do it again or anything. No, they just said have a match, and and this, you could hear this thing go across the ring and went, you know, and then come back and forth. And now it's a staple, you know, for the football games and everything. Yeah, you know, you see this overhead little dinky camera on this guideline, and yeah, it was sort of uh, interesting. And and um, uh, the film crew was were very cordial and and friendly and and nice and respectful and and um, you know it was an experience. Yeah. And and when you went to go to the cinema to see it, how bummed out were you that Michael Hayes got most of the camera time? Well, you know, the Freebirds always managed to, you know, get their mugs in there. And, and they, you know, they were a hell of a team. And, uh, you know, I didn't really care. You know, I think we all got the same money. Maybe Greg got five grand and, and we, you know, we only got 500 bucks. But, um, yeah, that but he, was a- he had 20% to pay on his contract, though. Like, you only had to pay 10. Well, I think he might have had a, you know, he was part of the booking crew. So I'm sure he got a percentage each town that he got, you know, help book. And then he ran the sh- card on the, you know, the night we were in the different towns, he'd, you know, tell everything what was going on. So I'm sure, you know, that's a, that's a big job. Mm, absolutely. I'm so glad you answered the Highlander question as well, because it's one of my favorite films and I, I love Queen as well. It's a great it was band. a good, it was a good film. Yeah. yeah. Matter of fact, I saw it. We were down in Florida. It was on one of the, I think it was uh, Ted Turner's uh, show, TNT or something, or TCM or whatever it was. But it was on there, and I said, Jesus. And, you know, and I can't remember well. It had to be. What was it? It was in the late 70s or early 80s or whatever it was. Well, it came out in, I think, 86, which is actually, um, this won't lead to the next question because I'm going to do a little game first, but that must have been one of the last matches you had in the AWA if they were filming in, let's say, mid-1985. Yes, I left there in June of 85, so it must have been, you know, before that. Yeah, and also they say in the film it's uh, Madison Square Garden. It wasn't because, obviously, uh, the AWA didn't run there, but they ran New Jersey, wasn't it? Yeah, and it was a good crowd, too. They had a hell of a crowd. All right, uh, I'm going to move on then. I'm going to give you uh, what I call name association. So basically, I'm going to give you a description or a sentence, and you tell me who best fits that description. And okay. you also cannot say yourself. And okay. the first one is funniest person in the locker room. Bobby Heenan. There's no comparison, is there, surely? Last man standing at the bar. Bobby Heenan. Oh, really, Bobby Heenan? Oh, God. He lived on vodka. <laughs> was this purely after the matches or? It was all day long. <laughs> Good for him. Um, right. Biggest bully. Jeez. Mm, you know, from my own personal experience, I... Um... I would have to say, and this this is sort of hearsay, but I saw it in the ring, and it might have been Billy Robinson. Because he'd take advantage of a guy, you know, and uh, I remember he uh, had a match with Bob Orton Jr., who I considered one of the greatest, you know, top five wrestlers of my era. He was incredible. And, and, And timing, unbelievable timing. And Bill, Billy sort of guzzled them up, and I thought that was really uncalled for. Right. Okay, uh, most picked on. Uh, this could be any locker room, not just the AWA, of course. Oh, gosh. He was the, he was the locker room whipping boy, as it were. Mm. You know, I can't really honestly answer that because I didn't see any abuse of you know, you know, uh, unless it was all in fun, you know, and that was that included everybody. But I, I didn't really see any real, you know, sadistic or any ill feelings, you know, brought on by anybody towards somebody else. No, that's good then. Um, best and worst road agents. I imagine this is WWF only. No, I'll say the worst 
um, was George Scott. He was a booker. And um, let's see, road agent, day, day, day. I'd say George Scott, I'll put him in both. <laughs> oh, how come the best then as well? Yes. Oh, the best. Oh, gosh. Um, Nick Bockwinkle. And let me see. Tony Greer and Jay Strongbow. Hmm. Definitely. I've heard Tony Greer quite a few times. He's a very divisive character as far as agents, but it depends on who it is. Um, the uh, wrestler who was least likely to visit the laundry. Oh, my God. Uh, Buck Zumhoff. <laughs> very good. We can't bury that guy enough, apparently. So uh, um, we... It's too bad about him. Yeah. Uh, most dangerous situation you ever found yourself in? Could be with fans, could be in a hotel afterwards. God, I can't think of any dangerous situation. It was on the road. Uh, Wahoo McDaniels going 80 miles an hour in a snowstorm and he passed out. And and we, did, we were going 360s in, on Highway 29 going up to Winnipeg, Canada. And we were in Sisseton, South Dakota that night. And then the next day we we're in Winnipeg and we were at an Indian reservation and they made Wahoo an honorary uh, chief. And they gave him this beautiful head, you know, bonnet, whatever, they, they, you know. And uh, Wahoo was drinking and, you know, Wahoo drank and, and he also took a lot of uh, medicinal aids and, and he was fine. And all of a sudden he started slurring his words and he lost control of the car and we were going and thank God nobody else was on this damn highway 29. Otherwise we would have been killed. Finally, the car stopped and it was broadside going down highway 29. Rene Goulet's in the back seat. He hit the floor. I finally, Wahoo was passed out, put my foot, drove my foot on the brake and put it in park. And I, Yelled at Wahoo. I says, God dang it, Chief, you damn near killed us. And he was out colder in a mackerel. Rene Goulet and I pulled him out, put him in the back seat, and we crossed uh, into Canada. And, and we <laughs> were at the border, and they said, who's in the back seat? And I said, Wahoo McDaniel. And they said, is he sleeping? And I said, yeah, more or less. And the next day, Wahoo never remembered driving. Wow. That was <laughs> That's about the closest incident that I'd ever, you know, had as far as driving. And I had a few, but that was really, uh, grace of God, we survived. Yeah, that certainly qualifies as a, a dangerous incident. Uh, the most talented wrestler you were ever in the ring with? I would say Nick Bockwinkle. And a close second would be Bobby Orton Jr., and another close third would be Rick Steamboat. Uh, another one who I never worked with, but I would have loved to, would be Jake Roberts. He was incredible in the ring. And then somewhere down the line, uh, Rick Flair. Hmm. <laughs> the Nature Boy. Was it, How far down the line is Rick Flair? Hey, or... You know, Rick was so... Uh, you know, his he, he was wrestling. I mean, he... he every bit of his life was geared about, you know, what he was going to do and how he lived. And, and he fit perfectly into the wrestling profession. And, you know, he was great. And uh, it's funny because I, I, did you ever see the 30, 30 on him? I saw the 30, 30. Yes. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because I, I watched all that happen and I watched him live, the, live that all out. And I remember we, Greg and I went to the opening here when they had it in Minneapolis and they asked me a question after the show. And I said, you know what? I said, if Rick would have had to do it all over again, he wouldn't have changed the thing. You know, he would have gone through the marriages and, and you know, whatever else he, because that's Rick. With Rick, I oh, might as well mention Rick a bit. Then is sure. you with the, was he in the camp the year after you were? No, he was in our camp. 
I thought Ric Flair was in 73 and you were in 72. I, I must be, well, no. you'll remember better than I will, obviously. 72. Rick was there. Yeah. 300 pounds he weighed. <laughs> well, I was going to ask that, actually. Was he still in the uh, Dusty Rhodes, I want to be the second coming of Dusty Rhodes mode at that point? I, I think so. Yeah, he, he was. And, you know, he was he was so far ahead of us because he he was made he was born to be a wrestler. I mean, everything he did and he was so far advanced and, you know, he could do interviews and he and he knew how you know, knew how to work and he knew how to get, get heat and he knew how to, you know, give a good comeback to a baby face. He, you know, and, and I, I did three one hour draws with him and it was, you know, it was, um, it was tiring, you know, it was up and down, up and, up and down for a long time. With his cardio, that's one of the most famous things that's said about Ric Flair. Is it as true as it was back then, as it probably was in the 90s, that he was always on the uh, on the stepper, he never went to bed, and he always seemed to have energy? Yeah, he did. He could, he could, I, he could do that Stairmaster at, you know, level 10 for an hour, you know, and he was in great shape. And uh, then, I, see, Rick was... Funny because when we go to the bars, you know, he was the life of the party, but he'd order a drink and then he'd have a couple sips and put it down. And then he'd go to someplace else and order another round and then have a couple sips and put it down. And then he'd go someplace else. And then people would say, Jesus God, he's got to be drunk. But he only had a sip. He out of the 10 drinks he ordered, he probably only had two. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way he was. <laughs> Did um oh I can't remember what else I was going to ask about Rick. It was good. Oh, that was it. It was uh when did Richard Flair become Rick Flair? Do you think? Uh the minute he went into the Mid Atlantic in Charlotte in nineteen seventy three or four, four I think it was seventy four. What was the event then that changed it? Uh I just think he that changed it to Rick Flair. It had the name right there and Flair. You know I thought. He and then it was uh, the Nature Boy, you know, from Buddy Rogers and and uh, the the big ten thousand dollar robes he'd wear and just his deal, you know, he was he was quite quite the personality. Uh, I'll give you a few more of the name association and we'll move on. Uh, uh, okay. clum clumsiest wrestler you ever wrestled? Oh God, Ox Baker. <laughs> Uh, anything? Why did he trip over with you at some point? Oh or? God! Well, he was a mammoth guy. Honest God, he was like six six and about three hundred twenty pounds, and he was a funny son of a gun. But he was clumsier in hell. I mean, he and he was he was meek and docile as hell. You know, he was like a little pussy cat. And, and but he, you know, his I don't know if you remember his his style in the ring. He was just ah, and he was real raw boned, but. He was he, he was quite a character. <laughs> the uh, greatest enhancement talent or jobber that you uh, ever wrestled. Oh gosh. Oh. Iron Mike Sharp. He managed to beat the crap out of you before you could be there. <laughs> <laughs> he was a good guy too. Uh, how many times was he locked into an arena uh, while still in the shower? That was him, yeah. Did you hear about that? Yeah, it, it I've was... heard that a couple of times. I've heard it Boston may happen more Garden. than once. Well, it happened in Boston Garden, and the dogs, they let the dogs out, and the dogs had him cornered up on top of a goddamn locker panel. And, the, and the, you know, he'd like to work out after the matches, and he'd forget, you know, people got to go home. So he'd work out an hour after the matches, and then they'd lock the damn place up, and the dogs keep. Yeah, he was he, he was a care. And it's too bad he died soon too. I mean, he died early. Yeah, uh, what made him the best then? Was he Yeah, what made well, him the best? Well, he 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 worked his ass off in the ring and he was physically um he was good in the ring, but he you know, he he didn't spare any punches. I mean, he was rough. I he I remember he hit me with an elbow and cracked two roots of my teeth. And I'm, I'm still dealing with that to this day. He whacked me. Oh, God. And, and right away I knew it. And, it, and in the next day, it was in Detroit, and I had to fly to 
um, New York the next day and wrestle in the garden. And when I flew in the airplane, it compounded that crack and my face swelled up and I got an infection. So luckily the New York uh, Nick basketball team was on the plane with us. And I, I knew one of the players and he directed me to the, the trainer and the trainer gave me a car to this dentist in Central Park. So I got off the plane, took a cab, went right to the dentist and he, it took him five shots in Novocaine. And then he drilled out the hole in both of my teeth and he says, you're going to need a root canal at the very least in these. And, you know, and, and thank God. But then when I went to the ring, the doctor noticed, he said, are, are, have you been on any drugs? And, I, you know, that this uh, Novocaine, five shots of Novocaine, they have epinephrine in it, and which is a speed. So my heart was pounding, you know, after five shots. And he said, I don't know if I can let you wrestle. I said, I'm fine. So he said, okay. But that was... I'll never forget that. That was one of the ooh, I, uh, the most painful nights I had. I think wrestling. The good old uh, New York State Athletic Athletic Commission. If you were currently breathing, you were good to go. That's right. <laughs> I'll give you one more, uh, and this is the one that I always say for the last because it always yields the best stories. Is the most memorable backstage fight? Oh God, uh, Flint, Michigan. And it was between Danny Spivey and uh, uh, Adrian Adonis, Keith Franks. And Danny Spivey was a big guy, six, 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 seven, nice guy, but he was a he was a fierce guy. He was a tough son of a gun. I'd put him right up there with Haku, you know, as far as the top three tough guys in our business. And Adrian always had it. Well, a history of working with young guys being stiff with them. So he was stiff with um, uh, Danny. And and I remember watching the match. Bob Orton and I were watching the match from the outside because we knew that there was some friction there. So all of a sudden, Adrian puts a sleeper on Danny. And you could see it was pretty snug. And Danny's trying to get out. And all of a sudden, Danny turns around gives him an elbow and then boom, he hits him right in the jaw. Boom. Down goes Adrian and out and, and then Danny Spivey goes over him. So Orton and I, and a couple other guys ran into the ring and said, Oh God, please. You know, and Adrian doesn't know what the hell's going on. So what happened was um, they get back to the locker room and uh, Adrian comes in the locker room, the baby face locker room. And he, he starts talking to Danny Spivey and he goes to leg dive him. And when he went to leg dive him, Danny Spivey threw an uppercut from about two feet off the ground and hit Adrian right here. And Adrian went up in the air and landed like a, a big, uh, you know, platypus boom. And you could see he had cut him right here and his jawbone was, or his cheekbone was sticking through the, and that, I mean, he's lucky he didn't kill him. I mean, and he was, he wanted more. And Adrian just was raw. And Adrian Adonis was never the same in the ring again. Never. Uh, was this when he was still doing the leather jacket thing? Or was this when he was becoming adorable, do you know? Yeah, it was when he was adorable. Right. Yeah. So not as adorable after the thing. And what's worse is he started the fight and then tried to, I don't know. I don't know what he's thinking. Um, I'll yeah. move. I'll move on then. And um, okay. Uh, you tell me when you start getting bored, and I'll start wrapping up and everything. But I've got a million okay. questions. And uh, well, the first, the next one is: uh, Why did you end up going to the WWF in 1985? Was it uh, Vern pushing you out, or did Vince McMahon court you, or how did? Uh, no, you no, know? no. Here's what happened: Was I had started the gym in 1982. I needed something that to rely on, and I knew a lot about uh, working out, etc. I didn't know any anything about business, but I thought mm. so. I started my own jumping gym, Brunzel's gym in my hometown of White Bear Lake. It was 5,000 square feet. I had $60,000 worth of equipment. I had a beautiful steam bath and I had a nice uh, six or eight person world pool. So I needed some money, you know, to continue keeping, the, you know, feeding this thing. So what happened when the, when Vince was sucking all the territory talent 
you know, things were getting bad for the WW or AWA. And I told Vern, I went to him and I said, Vern, I said, I'm going to need a personal contract with you. Otherwise I'm, I, I can't make it the way it is. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I've got my gym and you know, I, and he says, well, how much do you need? And I said, I need a, a ongoing contract for $95,000 a year guaranteed by you. And he told me, he looked me right in the face. He said, you're not worth it. Go to New York. So I said, okay. So I went to New York and that was it. So simple as that then. So uh, did you have a sit down meeting with Vince McMahon to discuss what you do in the territory or, or, or who Never. did anyone vouch for you to basically say, this is a guy we need. Hulk did Hulk who was, who was in Minneapolis in, in AWA in 1982 and 83. And was just, he's, I mean, he, and I think, Vern was jealous of him because Vern realized, you know, this guy could undo all the records and just completely make people forget, not forget about Vern Gagne, but, you know, the change from the athlete, you know, all American athlete to the big muscle bomb blonde headed guy who talked, you know, crap on the deal and, and could back it up in the ring, you know? And so, you know, that was quite a contrast. And, and in, Vince just said, okay, you're going to be in. And I remember first day, first guy I ever met, I flew into LaGuardia and we had to do uh, Poughkeepsie, New York TV. And I got on a little plane and I saw this big, God dang, big guy with a big beard. And it turned out to be Hillbilly Jim Morris. And he had just come back from uh, dislocating his kneecap. So I, I got, I, I got in the plane. I talked with him and, we, and I'll never forget my first, interview uh in poughkeepsie it was a baby face interview i had nothing to talk about i didn't know you know where i was going to go so it was a normal uh interview and i was doing it with gene oakland who had left the awa and it was great he was without a doubt the best guy ever on the, the stick interviewer so after i got done with the interview as i walked away i heard vince mcmahon say you know whisper he says oh god we got another bob backland and I heard that and I thought, oh, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> so I had a love-hate relationship. Well, uh, I don't even, maybe it was a like-hate relationship with Vince McMahon for eight years. He fired me three times. <laughs> and um, I just I just didn't get along with him. Well, I'll bring up Vince McMahon uh, in a few questions time. But before we do, uh, when did the Killer Bees thing come up? Because obviously... You were always a tag team wrestler for over a decade, but B. Brian Blair, who was coming in at the same time, wasn't. He was more of a single star. So what led to you two being put together, and had you ever even met him before? Never met him before, and and Brian had teamed up with Steve Kern down in Florida. I think they were the U.S. champions as a tag team. And, and um, Brian was a good worker, you know, and, and it was Hulk's idea because Hulk suggested that, you know, Brian and I team up. So we're up in Canada and uh, Billy Red uh, Lions, you know, had looked at us and, you know, and tried to figure out, you know, something. And he said, well, it's Brunzel and Blair. And there was a defensive uh, group at Miami Dolphins called the Killer Bees. There was a number of players on their defense and they all, <laughs> last name started with Bees. So the next thing we know, he floats this idea of, being called the killer bees. And it just so happened that Lanny Poffo uh, was in the locker room and he had these black and yellow tights that were brand new. So Brian and I wore the tights and became the killer bees. <laughs> then a little bit after that, we added the mask, which was incredible. I mean, we had one of the best gimmicks for any baby face team in, in 20 years of wrestling. And Vince just went, he, you know, he just didn't fulfill our, you know, our end potential. Yeah. Potential is right. With, with the masks, had another team yes. done that previously uh, and where you got the idea from? Nope. Not that I know of. I, I didn't know of any baby face team. There was a lot of heel teams, but no baby face team had ever used the mask. And it was such a great reversal because we used the mask 
And then we'd go back and forth in and out. And nobody knew. Him. We didn't even know who was the legal guy. And then we wind up winning the match, you know, and it was uh, the people loved it. Actually, that was going to be my next question was, how come you thought that would be a good fit for a baby face team? Because if it's never been done before for a baby, that strikes me as a heel thing to do. Yet you made well, it work. It, it, it was a heel thing to do, but it was a way that the baby face could use a heel gimmick to get back at the heels, which had never been done. So it was a, a, a great idea. And, you know, we... I, I'll never forget, we had a match with the Hearts in Madison Square Garden. I think it was 20 or 30 minutes, and it was a draw. And it was a hell of a match. Uh, then we had a match. Uh, one of the first matches on TV was in Buffalo, New York. And we used the mask for the first time. And we wound up uh, beating beating Jim Neidhart. Boom, boom, jumped out of the ring. And the people went crazy. And they gave us the belts and then they took the belts away because they didn't know who was a legal guy and all that. But it just, you know, we could have done absolutely tremendous business. But for some, well, I know for one thing, Vince and I never got along. He didn't like me. And uh, I think the feelings were mutual. I just didn't like what he did, his conception of what wrestling should be. And I just, it was contrary to everything that I, you know, knew in the wrestling business after being, you know, brought into it by such a strict uh, kayfabe guy as Vern Gagne. Well, as you say, Vern Gagne, very staunch in the old school, map-based yes. rules. Uh, Vince McMahon going in the cartoon route, appealing to children. We know the story. When did you realize that the WWF way was going to win? Oh, right away, because well, he, they had Hulk Hogan. And when they had Hulk, he was the golden goose. See, the WWE today could never been what it became without Hulk Hogan. He was incredible. He, the people loved him. He was the biggest, biggest star in pro wrestling, and he had it all together. He's a nice guy. He could work. Um looked the part, and had a hell of a rap. With Hogan, um, obviously I think you've alluded to it before, and I think people would agree, is that Vern Gagne really didn't do right by Hogan, and didn't do right by himself for not getting fully behind him. Uh, when did you sort of realise that Hogan in the AWA was going to be the next big thing, and why was Vern just so averse to using him? Well, I knew right away when, when they brought Hulk in as a heel, and they had Johnny Sullivan um, be his manager. And um, all of a sudden he got over as a, as a heel, as a baby face. And, you know, he was beating two guys in the ring on TV. And all of a sudden, you know, he, the people loved him. So they decided to make him a baby face. And my idea, and, and I, I think that Vin, or Vern was jealous of the fact that he had started the AWA under the auspices of having a scientific all-American type wrestler. And all of a sudden, this beach boy, guitar playing, muscle head, blonde guy has just broken everything open and it, the people just loved him. And Hulk Hogan loved the AWA and he loved it because of the schedule allowed him. He didn't have to work hardly any of the uh, spot shows. It was just so he'd work three times a week. That was it. You know, and he, I mean, he oh, it, I never saw such record crowds. I mean, there was I mean, it was unbelievable. And the fact is, Vern was too. His ego got in the way of giving Hulk the, the belt. And, you know, Greg says, well, we were going to give him the belt. And I said, well, you didn't. And you should have. And then there was another deal, too, that uh, and this is a rumor that, um, you know, they had so sold these T-shirts, you know, uh, would be champ or should be champion Hulk Hogan. And they, I had heard that they had owed Hulk $40,000 in, you know, revenue from these T-shirts. And for some reason or other, they never never did pay him. So 
I think that was a crowning blow, plus the fact that he had wrestled Bachwinkle in almost all the major towns and couldn't beat him, you know, due to outside interference or whatever disqualification. And uh, I, 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 I had been told by Greg recently that CBS wanted to give AWA a, a one-time contract or one-time TV deal to have Nick wrestle the Hulk and then have Hulk beat him on national TV on CBS Sports. That's what Greg told me, but I, I don't know if that's true or not, but it would have, you know, it would have cemented the AWA, but because Vern didn't like that idea of having a, you know, muscle head guitar player being his world champion, he screwed himself. Well, it makes no sense either, really, because he put Dr. D. Dave Schultz in as one of his antagonists as well, and he wasn't a map-based wrestler. And as far as I no. can tell, those two sold out a lot as well. That's true, and and David was a, a good friend of Terry's, so that's why he came up, and he had that uh, southern twang to him, you know, sort of like an outlaw type guy, and uh, uh, had, you know, some decent matches with Hulk, and um, I think, you know, it ran its course, and then, you know, I think the main deal was that Hulk should have beaten Nick, you know, for the championship. And then when that didn't happen and it didn't happen on, you know, multiple times at, at huge houses, I think the fans were just sort of, you know, fed up with it. Yeah. I've also heard the story where Vern said, oh, well, I was going to give him the title in early 84. It's like, well, you had months. You had months and months and months to do it. And, uh, you know, it didn't go exactly. that way. Are we okay to go a little bit longer or are you having enough? Sure. I got okay. about 10 minutes left. About 10 minutes left then. Okay, yeah. uh, I'll give you, uh, let me see, give you the uh, uh, greatest hits of what I'm going to give you. Um, could you rank for me, and I'll give you all the names um, oh of the, let's say, the top three greatest tag teams in the WWF that you and Brian faced. I'll give you the full list. Um, okay. Whether you wrestled them or not, they were in the company. The Rockers, the Dream Team, Strike Force, the Young Stallions, uh, the U.S. Express, the Barry Windham version, Nikolai Volkov and Iron Sheik, the Islanders, Fabulous Rougeos, Powers of Pain, the Bushwhackers, Demolition, Heart Foundation, King Kong Bundy and John Studd, the British Bulldogs, the Brain Busters, the Funks, and Bob Orton and Don Morocco. Out of those three, I can actually even put them up for you in case you can uh, see them. Oh, well, I can tell you right now, uh, the top three teams... Um, one was the Hearts, uh, the other one was the British Bulldogs, and I think the third one, uh, let me see, there. let me see here. Uh, I think the third one had to be Nikolai Volkov and, and Kosro because um, we had a little history with them. And, um, you know, we worked with them in the WrestleMania three and it, we should have beat them outright, you know, and, and we didn't, but I think those were the three, three teams. And I tell you what, um, we had, a, we had a match in Montreal with the Bulldogs and I think it was a 20 or 30 minute draw. What a match, honest to God, Davey and, and Tommy just were, I mean, we had a heck of a match and those guys were you know, uh, notorious outside the ring as far as all their little uh, <laughs> their little deals that they play on guys, but uh, the ribs. But in the ring, I mean, they were they were really good, and and it's a shame that both those guys have passed. You know, it it really is. They were great talents. So if you had to put uh, a one, two, and three on them, Bulldogs, Hearts, and Nickelein, Iron Cheek, who would you say in what in in order? I would say uh, in order, the hearts and second one would be British Bulldogs and then and then uh, Sheik and Volkov third. Fine answer. Fine answer the lot of them. Uh, this will be a very quick question, but uh, San Juan, you must remember that day. I think it was at 85. Ooh. San Juan, oh, Puerto, San Juan. Puerto Rico, outdoor. Oh, God, in the rainstorm. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. 
And I, 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 I want to say we wrestled Barry Orton and somebody else, but I remember they, they threw the main event on first. Our, our second because they wanted to make sure the crowd got to see it. But we were sitting there. Honest to God, the rain came down so hard and I was in the ring and I, I couldn't even see where Brian was. And it was funny because our plane on the way out of there that night got hit by lightning. Scared <laughs> the crap out of me. And oh, it was a, oh, it was a big DC-10 and, and it just hit and rrr, 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 shook and I thought, oh shit, here we go. But I remember that night because it was so hard and there was actually a puddle in the ring, the water, and it took, my boots were so wet, it took about four days for them to dry out. They were, and it was, I, I, I thought, what in the world are we doing here, you know? And yeah, that was probably the most precarious match I think I had in my career under, you know, the circumstances of the weather. Yeah, you've got Gorilla Monsoon under a tarpaulin calling, oh, calling God, the matches. Yes. Th- yeah, it was crazy. I think I Jesse think- Ventura just left. I think he was commentating. Yeah, he just got up and went. Oh, I know it. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Who did you say that you were wrestling? I've just I've just looked it up. Pardon? Who, who was the tag team you said you uh, thought you were wrestling? I thought it was Barry um, Orton and Mike Sharp. I don't know. Absolutely, it? you are absolutely right. Yeah, and it was it my mind still? My my wife says my mind's going, and sometimes I question it. But um, I remember, you know, different instances real well. But you know, I might go downstairs and forget who I just had the interview with. So that, that that's probably the the worst thing that all the wrestlers I know are you know worried about is concerned is you know dementia because we. You know, you can't help it. You know, I, I got to tell you a quick joke uh, about Bobby Heenan. He was in Minneapolis and he had a book and he was on a local uh, radio show, which is a huge radio station called WCCO. And there was a um, a talent. Um, his name was Dark Star and he had he loved Bobby Heenan. So I brought Bobby to the studio and we're sitting down and I, I'm not saying anything. And Dark Star is going back and forth with Bobby Heenan. And, and Bobby's got him laughing like a son of a gun. So Dark Star said to him, Heenan, he says, I know, he says, you've been hit by a lot of objects, but he says, and I know you've been hit by steel chairs. He says, I just want to know how many times have you been hit in the head with a steel chair? And Bobby looks at him and he says, Dark, he says, I've been hit so many times in the head with a steel chair. He says, the top of my head smells like ass. And, <laughs> and, and this dark star fell out of his chair laughing. This was live on radio, you know, and he went crazy. And I'll never forget that. That was the funniest thing. And it would just, just came to Bobby like that. <laughs> he's, he's another one who's just like, just the saddest of losses as well. Oh, oh, the last God. few years of his life as well. I mean, awful, awful. Oh, and he was just, yes. yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I'll, uh, I'll use my last few minutes of the interview wisely then. And I'll have to ask first time meeting Andre the Giant and first time partying with Andre the Giant. Oh, geez. I met Andre oh, when he came in. He used to come in all the time during, uh, a special time in AWA it was towards the fall and they'd always have a battle Royal. And then the winner would, you know, wind up wrestling Nick Bockwinkle as the champion. And it was always Andre. So uh, Andre and I got along great. I, I, I'll tell you a quick story about Andre. Um, and this is about his drinking. I was commissioned to drive him from Peoria, Illinois to Moline. It's a hundred miles because his girlfriend was flying in from California, whatever. So Wally Carbo told me to get a Cadillac, make sure that he was comfortable and away we went. So after the matches, we stopped at a liquor store and he got two six packs of Budweiser. So I'm driving down the road and he's got to meet her. It's, I don't know. I think she gets in 1130 and it was probably 10, 10 o'clock. We're driving down the road. I'm going pretty fast. I'm going 72 miles an hour, 75. All of a sudden I'm driving down the road and I see this cop turn his lights on. He comes across the median and he stops me, pulls me over. 
And he said, do you know why I stopped? And I said, I'm probably speeding. And I said, I'm getting, I said, I have to get this uh, gentleman to the airport by 11. He's he's got a special plane that he's got to catch to New York. So he's got his flashlight and he sees Andre in the front seat and he sees, um, (laughs) he sees a big bag and he says, what's in the bag? And Andre goes, looks at me, goes beer. And he's, and the cop says, what? And he says, beer. And so he says, get out of the car. So he gets out of the car and the cop looks at him. He's going, oh, my God. And then he grabs the bag and, and he sees there's seven bottles gone out of a 12 pack. Seven bottles. We've only gone 10 miles. And he said to Andre, he said, did you drink all that beer? And Andre said, yes. And so he looks at me and he said, did you have any? I said, no, I said, I'm drinking a Pepsi. And I showed him a Pepsi. So he says, okay, open your trunk. He says, so we put the, the beer in the trunk. We're driving still 65 miles an hour to get to Peoria. So finally we go 20, 20 some miles or so. And um, Andre says, Jimmy. And I says, yes. He says, pull over. I says, what for? He says, I want the rest of the beer. <laughs> but, <laughs> Here he had drank seven bottles of beer in about 10 miles. I mean, I mean, that's 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes, you know, and he just, boom, boom. and the cop couldn't believe it. How, I, and how, Andre, Andre was a lovable guy and, and I got along great with him. It's just impossible to be a giant. You know, he was, he was such a loving and kind person, you know. How often did he need a piss? You know, uh, he could hold pretty much, but he also had um, some hellacious, uh, what would we, would we call, well, farts. He had some incredible farts that, that, that last 20, 25 seconds. And he'd go, whoa, afterwards, you know, and everybody sort to vacate it. But here's another quick story. He had been very good to me. I, I loved him very much. And I, we were up in Winnipeg in very similar situation, big battle royal, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, so there was a place called Chez Andre, and it was a French restaurant. So I said, I'm going to take Andre for lunch there. So I take him for lunch, and they have a special. They had this pork cutlet, and it was like $6.99. So I thought, shit, no problem. So we go in. And uh, the waiter comes and he says, what would you like to drink? So Andre says he, he, he had some Remy Martin uh, cognac, a couple shots, and then I had a Pepsi. So then we ordered the, the pork cutlet and then he ordered a bottle of wine. So I get the bill, it was 125 bucks. So here are these two orders of $6.99 turned into 125 bucks. So I said to Andre, I says, Andre, next time we go out to dinner, I buy the food you buy the booze and he's okay, boss. <laughs> <laughs> seems like a good trade off. It seems like a good trade. <laughs> if I can beg just a couple more minutes of your time, I'd like to sure. do the finale of the show. And sure. I call it the firing line. And it's sort Why? of similar as the name association. I give you names of people. You just tell me what you think about them. And for the most part, I'm sure you're going to say they're all great guys. And if there's a tiny little story to throw in there as well, please do. And the first okay. name I've got on here is George Wells. Uh, great athlete. Fair enough then. Um, it's all right. Don's filled me in with the rest of the story already, so uh, you don't need to go into any more. Honky Tonk Man. These are all WWF, by the way, but Honky Tonk Man. Uh, lucky individual. <laughs> How so? Well, uh, Wayne um, was limited in his skills, but he played his gimmick to the hilt. He was his gimmick, you know, very good. And he, he made a lot of money. And, you know, I just thought he was sort of limited in his skills in the ring. Fair enough then. Uh, somebody who you wrestled late on your WWF career that I don't think people know is Nails, Kevin Wackholes. Very fortunate person. He was a friend of Hulk Hogan's. Uh, nice guy, very nice guy, but limited in his... Um, abilities his skills in the ring uh, were you there when he strangled vince mcmahon or did you help yes. strangle him no but i was in line to talk to vince and it was at green bay and uh <laughs> it was funny because 
we were waiting in line. There's about four or five guys and Vince says, yeah, I'm going to be, you know, da, da, da. And then, so we're waiting outside this room. So uh, Kevin was in there and all of a sudden I heard this. And what had happened was they had paid uh, Kevin uh, not the same scale that they paid the guy he was working with. And Kevin found out about it and he wanted his money. He said, I want the same amount of money. So he told Vince about it. And Vince said something like, I, I'm not going to pay you more. So, <laughs> so Kevin just grabbed him by the throat and was choking the shit out of him. And all of a sudden there was some commotion. And I heard, uh, you know, I was standing there and I thought, what the hell's going on? And one of the agents went in there and, and sort of pulled Kevin off of uh, Vince Meanwhile, Kevin goes right outside and there was a payphone. He dials 911 and he talked to the police and he says, yes, he says, I want to uh, report a sexual uh, attack on me by Vince McMahon at the Green Bay County Arena. Boom. That's what, <laughs> so he had it all planned out and so he was going to defend himself. I don't know whatever happened to it, but uh, needless to say, uh, Nails never wrestled again in the WWF. Needless to say that. He, he was going to be with The Undertaker, I believe, as a, as a feud straight after. So he, anyway, he could have made some more money. But uh, just before I get off that is, Bret Hart describes a very high-pitched, squeaky scream coming from Vince McMahon when he was getting strangled. Can you confirm that? I think I heard something like that, you know? And um, I think Nails did what about... 40 other guys would have loved to do, you know, if they had the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get along with Vince at all, as I said. But... No, I, I, if we had more time, I'd get into it. I really would. Okay. Uh, Rockin' Robbins, the next name. She was a girl. Um, Sam Houston's sister and Jake Roberts. Yes. I didn't know much about her. Right. Kamala. Nice guy. Ken Resnick. Uh, lucky individual. <laughs> You've said that more often than not. You're not a fan of Ken. Well, Ken's a nice guy, but I'm, you know, he was, I think he became a little more um, self-important. He realized than he actually was. Hmm. He's a good guy, but you know, I, you know, that's the way he struck me. Yep. Corporal Kirshner. Uh, real genteel, um, easy going. Mm. Ted R. C. D. Uh, very strong, but limited in the ring. I think that's fair enough to say. Uh, Gorilla Monsoon. Uh, wonderful guy. Mm. Uh, did he give you any direction as far as like the wrestling went or was he just the guy who told you to go out at a certain time or, or what role did he play in the backstage for you? He didn't, he actually uh, would let us know when we were to go home, when we were to go into the finish, you know, he would signal to the referee, blah, 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 you know, time for the boys to go home. And, and, you know, him and Bobby Heenan were a great, you know, uh, team as far as you know describing the the matches yeah i'll give you a few more uh ivan putsky a real character um a lot of people didn't realize that he played pro football for the detroit lions as a running back um for he he really milked his gimmick for all it was worth and he did a great job doing it yeah, as Don has told me, I keep referencing Don Morocco, by the way, but why not? Uh, uh, that He said that some people weren't big fans of Ivan at the time. Was it just because of where he wasn't, it was in the pecking order? or I, I don't know, you tell me, or if it's not even true. Well, this is my own interpretation. And I think that uh, uh, Joe Benardzik and, you know, Ivan Putsky, uh, which is very easy to do in the wrestling business, was very, um, you know, into his own gimmick and and wanted to make it go as far as he could. So he was sort of, you know, he might have um, 
piss some people off in terms of, you know, working with them or saying something to them. But in, in, in that regard, it's very easy to be selfish in this business, you know, because it, it, it's, it's all up to you. You know, the promoter can have a lot to do with it, but you have to perform. Yeah. Uh, okay. Then bad news, Brown, who I know you wrestled. Yes. Um, he came to the WWE at the end of his career. His knees were real bad. And he was a, a hell of a judo guy in the Olympics. And, and you know, I, I didn't get an opportunity to, you know, get very close to him. So it was sort of, you know, business is business. Earl Hebner. Great guy. One of the best referees and, and just a good guy. And uh, everybody loved him. And him and his brother, you know, were uh, more or less uh, – the anchors of the uh, refereeing crew there at the WWE. Hercules. Ray Hernandez, what a great guy. Great guy. I loved him. Died way too young. Um, actually, very talented in the ring, too. Virgil. Virgil. Uh, you know, that was sort of uh, that whole million-dollar man and Virgil was a takeoff on um, David Cro or Jimmy Crockett and Dusty Rhodes, you know, <laughs> and you can put them together. But um, Virgil just, uh, he, you know, he did a good job, you know, being uh, Teddy's uh, valet or whatever. <laughs> or whatever. I didn't realize, yeah. I didn't realize that Ted DiBiase was meant to be Jimmy Crockett. In, yes. in that whole affair, yeah, it was. So, uh, so Virgil's obviously a taker for Dusty, but uh, yeah. as, as valet or whatever, was it? Was it? What was? What's the hidden subtext there between the two? Do you think? Well, uh, I really don't know. I think um, you know Vince had a funny way of, you know, suggesting things. You know, he Vince was a brilliant guy. He just had a sort of a weird and warped sense of <laughs> ideas, but he sort of put things together like that, you know, and then, you know, he comes when Harley race comes in, he calls him the King of the ring, you know, and has him wear a crown. And, and that was a spoof on him, you know, and, and he went with it and it's, you know, well, it's, if you've got to carry a crown and cape around, I mean, that's punishment enough. If you've got to do it 300 times a, a year, Lord Alfred Hayes, and that's penultimate. Uh, Lord Alfred Hayes, um, wonderful guy. I learned a lot from him in Kansas City when he was tagged with Roger Kirby. Uh, funny guy, uh, loved his articulation of the Engli Engli English language, um, and uh, did a great job with the WWE, too. I'm so glad you said something nice about Lord Alfred because he's definitely one of my favorites. And oh, we, he was a great guy, and we cannot end. Uh, a, a list of wrestlers who may have an amusing story about them with Haku. Oh my God. Haku is one of the uh, most talented, uh, wonderful guys that I've met in this business. Uh, he has uh, another side that's very violent and uh, without a doubt, uh, he is the, the, toughest, um, most accomplished f street fighter I've ever seen. He, you know, he's 6'3", 295 pounds and quick as a cat. And he could, you know, probably jump up and kick a rim with his feet. And a nice guy, but if you, you know, r rile him up, I mean, I, I'll tell you one quick story. We're in a, a bar in Cleveland and the, the bar was owned by uh, a wide receiver for the Cleveland Browns. So there was a number of uh, football players there. And I think it was, it was either the night before or the night after or the night of the matches. And we were in this bar and there was Haku, Brian Blair, and myself, and I think Raymond Rougeau. We're at the bar and we're having a couple of drinks in, the, in these four football players, big guys, from the Browns when they're talking and they were about wrestling. 
you know, about phony this and this and that and this. So Haku, he's drinking cognac and Coke. Boom, he puts it down. He walks over to the table and he said, fellas, he says, I realize you guys are here just to have a little bit of good time, just like our, our, we are up at the bar. But he says, if the, I'm going to tell you right now, if I hear any more shit about wrestling, there'll be trouble. And he turned around, walked away. They didn't say another word. <laughs> it's funny because there was a couple of 300 pounders there. And, I, you know, he he was just, I, I remember <sighs> he was in a fight one night at a bar and there was three guys. And he hit one guy with a chop in the neck and another, and he came back and hit the other guy with an open hand in the face. And the other guy came up out of his chair. Haku dove across the table and bit the guy in the nose. And his nose was just hanging there. And the guy went into shock. And Haku got arrested and they litigated it out of court. But I know it costs a lot of money. I think Vince had to pay it. What is it with Haku that strangers and s- local tough guys look at and think, that's someone I really want to tangle with? Well, I think it's stupidity on their behalf. And, and most people I find that have that mentality are not very bright because at the worst, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if they know his background and just to look at him, you know, he, he was... I remember I worked with him when he was 18 years old in Japan and he was working with, for Baba and he threw me in the ropes and hit me with the drop kick and almost knocked me out. And he, as he was covering me, I said to him, I said, I'm supposed to give those, not take those. (laughs) (laughs) He looked at me like, what, you know, but yeah, he's a wonderful guy and he lives in uh, Kissimmee, Florida. And I, I believe he's still, has something to do with uh, uh, auto dealership down there. Yeah, and his uh, son is it is it Tamatonga? I believe he's in New Japan at the moment. Uh, so you know it's it's carrying on. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, right, thank you so much, Jim. I, you know, I realised we've gone a bit over, and you know, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I'm going to do the wrap up now. So thank you everybody for watching. Uh, I don't know who I'm going to have on next week. It just, I suppose, it just do. It just depends who. Uh, wants to talk to me but uh, we'll have someone on next week I'll post it for you and we'll catch you again next week and thank you very much Jim for spending so much time with us thank you it was a lot of fun James